Welcome everyone to the breakout session Robotics API with GNN and Distributed GPU Accelerated Neural Networks with GNN. I am the, the moderator, Tim Humphrey. I'll introduce the presenters for both presentations now. And we'll have the presentations and after the presentations, we'll have the Q&A. If you want to ask the question, put it in the chat box and be sure to say who the question is for. Our first presentation will be Robotics API with GNN, presented by Ty Donovan and Jack Fields both from American Heritage School. Ty Donovan is graduate of the State University of New York at Portland with a degree in early and secondary science education <coughs> and studied abroad at the London Metropolitan University, focusing on exceptional education and the British education system. His 20 years of teaching experience includes Winton School in London, UK, Advent School in Boca Raton, where he served as science department chair, and Lead America in Boca Raton, where he was program director for the engineering and robotics program, helping to design the curriculum and to manage the teaching staff. Mr. Donovan is currently the Director of Robotics at American Heritage School at the Boca del Rey campus, as well as the first robotics competition team coach and founding mentor. Jack Fields is a 12th grade high school student who has developed an impressive amount of experience in Java, Python, and C++ from the robotics and computer science courses provided by a school and his involvement in the Stallion Robotics Team 5472. Jack is the Director of Programming for the team. They currently are working on an autonomous security robot. Jack submitted a poster in our 2019 technical poster contest showcasing the progress that the team has made on the robot. Our second presentation will be Distributed GPU Accelerated Neural Networks with GNN presented by Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy is a third year PhD student in computer science at Florida Atlantic University with research interest in deep learning and parallel and distributed computing. This year, Robert joined our intern program for the third year. His intern research project was accelerating distributed, uh, <clears throat> distributed learning, deep learning using GNN by enabling the use of GPUs. Hi, Jack, it's your floor. Thank you, Tim, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all in attendance, and especially a huge thanks to LexisNexis and HPCC Systems for this uh, amazing opportunity. Uh, as an educator, one of my main goals is providing opportunities uh, for my students. Uh, and this is one of those opportunities that has a lot of implications far beyond uh, the classroom that we're in right now. And I just wanted to take a little bit of time to introduce this day and age, I think one of the, the biggest concerns that we have in education is the safety of our campus, our students, uh, and the faculty that reside there. So this project, touches on how we can take what we know, what we do well, building robots, programming robots, 
in getting information into the hands of first responders and our sec security personnel here. Um, one of the things that we have uh, here at the school is a lot of uh, a lot of really uh, educated, um, hardworking students, and each one of them had a very specific role on this robot. The first thing that we wanted to do was to make something that could traverse the school campus and gather information. We wanted to make sure that we could identify uh, personnel that were on comp campus that were supposed to be there versus some that may not have. And we didn't want this to go all Skynet. We didn't want any, any robot tracking down or chasing down uh, any grandparents or somebody that may have forgotten to register uh, with our security office. We wanted to make this is something that would enhance the security personnel's job on campus. So the intention is to have this is somewhat of a mobile security platform and mobile kiosk so people can go up and interact with the robot, have limited access through their ID, whether that's with a magnetic card reader, RFID, uh, or barcode scanner. Um, this will allow the students to have limited access. So in addition to the security, they would be able to access their schedule, a class map, uh, bell schedule to let them know where they should be at any given time. And in addition to that, it would give us um, the opportunity to uh, converse back and forth with our security personnel. This uh, was extended this year, uh, in, I think in the time of COVID that we have right now, we had to break the project down from the big project that you see behind us so the students could take the individual parts back with them. So we have uh, the autonomous uh, driving platform uh, that is a GNSS based um, or a global um, kind of like a, a GPS system. In addition to that, we have a number of cameras that are taking data in so we can identify through facial recognition. Um, and that was part of what Jack was working on. Uh, in addition to this project, we have uh, the need to uh, monitor who's coming and going through our campus. So uh, another uh, addition to the project was the license plate recognition and collecting that data and storing that so we could track uh, the movement of cars that are coming and going on our campus. Um, now, generally, this is where I would uh, continue talking um, about all the amazing things the students have done. But what I'd like to do is give them the platform so they can share their individual contributions. Right now, I'm going to turn this over to Gabriella. She has been uh, the project manager on this and she's going to uh, take over from here. Good morning, my name is Gabriella Luiso and I'm a senior at American Heritage. First off, I would like to introduce all the students that were involved in the project, beginning with Anthony Gugliano, Riley Wurst, Ben Weinberger, Anthony Nakocha. Jack Fields, and Karina Wayne. We are really excited to give this presentation to everyone, everyone and give a glimpse into our autonomous security product that we created for our school. The security robot will have a customized introductory greeting and name recognition. We have further our integration with HPCC systems by using the HPCC systems GNN bundle with TensorFlow we have also upgraded our robot API to work with the newest versions of ROS. My specific role on the team was I worked on the coordination and communication side of things, making sure that students at home were able to communicate with us while we were working in the lab. Also, I was able to coordinate with everyone's schedules, allowing us to contribute to the project at one time. I was able to construct timelines to guarantee that we stayed on track by setting and maintaining deadlines. And I also bridge the communication gap between team members and personnel from Lexus Nexus. Thank you. I hope you enjoy our presentation. Hello, my name is Anthony Lloyd. Hello, my name is Anthony Guglielmo and I am a senior. I worked on the license plate recognition system for the robot. Hundreds of vehicles pass through our campus daily using one or two entrances. The school has a system in place that uses stickers on cars to identify who should be here, but it could be improved, and that is what I aim to do. We started by thinking of what should be done, 
and decided that recording license plates automatically can be useful to determine if an unregistered car is on campus, which can be very helpful with safety. First, I researched license plate cameras and found a good model to get that could be easily integrated into our school systems and with the robotics API. Next, as the cameras were being shipped, I designed mounts for the cameras on CAD so that they can be connected at the entrances and exits of the school. Once the cameras came in, we connected them to the computer and ran Jack's code on them to identify different license plates. We got the system to work and can now use HPCC systems to store the data we collected on campus. The future plan is to place the cameras at the entrances and exits of the campus to keep it as safe as possible. On this slide, you can see two photos. One of the license plate cameras that we will be using and the other of the camera working, recognizing the license plate. It first tries to find it and highlights it with a red rectangle, then takes a photo of that and converts it to grayscale so it can read the numbers better. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ben Weinberger. I'm a senior. I work with Riley on systems that interact with the robot. My section of the project included working with the digital side and incorporating the phys physical components with the digital UI. Hello, I'm Riley Worst, a junior at American Heritage. While Ben worked on the digital aspects of the systems, I worked on the physical parts. This included finding the needed components for the system and prototyping mounting hardware to attach them to the robot. Our section as a whole uh, entailed working with the physical components interface with the robot's internal computer to display a wide range of uh, information. These components included a barcode scanner, a magnetic card strip reader, a fingerprint scanner, a 22-inch touchscreen monitor, and an RFID scanner. Our portion of the project also entailed working to make the interface for the computer and the components easier to operate. The goal for the user interface was to make the system simple and self-explanatory so that individuals on campus do not need prior knowledge in order to interact with it. To begin this phase of the project, we began by designing the user interface to incorporate the components as well as to start to implement the touchscreen onto the robot. The first of the physical components to be worked on was the RFID scanner. The RFID scanner has two sets of outputs that are dependent on the role of the user. The first output is de designated for students and the information that, the out that is output includes the student's class schedule as well as the bell schedule. The second output is designated for teachers who will receive a modified class schedule that includes the number of students enrolled in the class as well as any meetings that they are scheduled to attend throughout the day. While implementing the RFID scanner into the user interface, we also worked to prototype mounts to attach the scanner to the body of the robot. First of the physical components to be worked out there. Uh, the barcode scanner is going to be implemented into the school's already existing lunch system to allow students who forgot to purchase food ahead of time to order food before the lunch period. The barcode scanner will also check any purchases that have not been approved or paid at the time, as well as checking the balance in the account. The magnetic card strip reader is going to be incorporated into the robot to allow the system to double as a check-in station for any students that who may arrive late to campus, so that they do not have to go to the front desk every time they arrive late to school. The last system that we plan to incorporate is the fingerprint scanner. The fingerprint scanner will allow administrative access to the robot, allowing any authorized personnel to access any files or information that they may need. Hi, my name is Jack Fields. I am also a senior at American Heritage. And uh, this summer, I participated in the HPCC Systems Internship Program, where I worked with my mentors, David D. Hillister and Xiaoming Wang, where I was able to use the HPCC Systems GNM bundle to train a model to recognize known faces. This was one of the biggest steps into the integration of robotics into the HPCC platform. I was able to utilize a convolutional neural network, also known as CNN. This allowed me to go through a series of convolutions where it takes the data from an image and creates a feature map and pooling where specific regions are extracted and then selected as, or sorry, the maximum values are extracted and then used as the entire value for the selected area. During my testing, I also compared the differences between using TensorFlow with the GNN bundle and just running it on a standalone Python system. I found my results to be very similar, and you can find more depth information about this on my poster presentation submission. 
Numerous updates were also made to the Robotics API to allow it to work with the newest version of ROS, as well as to work with the newest version of FRC robot code. All the code is also going to be available on the Stallion Robotics GitHub page, and I believe there's a link to that on the poster presentation. My name is Anthony Nikosha, and I am a senior at American Heritage. Um, I took part in both the physical design of the robot as well as the development of a virtual reality sit environment for monitoring the robot systems as well as any relevant security information. Uh, just a basic outline of the physical aspects of the robot. Uh, the robot uses two sets of six inch pneumatic wheels to traverse its surroundings. Each set of wheels is powered by a custom manufactured dual motor gearbox designed to offer an optimal balance between speed and torque. Uh, plan changes to the robot include optimizing the drivetrain gearboxes for speed, as well as upgrading the robot's vision system, sensors, and cameras. We also plan on implementing a more robust mounting system for hardware components. For the virtual reality environment, I designed a virtual reality environment for a more user-friendly experience while monitoring sensor readouts, camera feeds, and other robot systems. I began by first creating a small environment to test basic functionality such as displaying images, video files, and video feeds from USB cameras. After I'd successfully achieved, it, uh, achieved this basic functionality, I built a more complex user-friendly environment with multiple video and informational displays integrated into a virtual security office. Uh, this following video shows a short demonstration of this security office. So on one of the screens, you can see that the facial recognition is being displayed so that people monitoring the systems can see who is traveling around campus and other information such as this will be displayed on other displays in the future. Hi everyone, I'm Karina and I am a sophomore. My role involved configuring the voice commands and figuring out the autonomous driving of the robot around campus. So in order for the robot to be more interactive for students, staff, and parents, we used Alexa voice commands. These voice commands can be created and customized through the Alexa developer console. Now outside of robotics, you can also use this program to create and publish private skills and essentially customize your own Amazon Echo products. But for our purposes, ideally, any information that students currently have to go on the school website to check, like testing schedules, school events, and lunch menus, can now all be answered by the robot. So I use the skills testing function within the Alexa Developer Console to test the commands, and you'll see pictures of that on the next slide. Right now, that includes a customized introductory greeting, name recognition, and a student schedule locator. The first picture on the top left is the home page of the Alexa Developer Console. The different categories of commands are on the right side of the home page. And the second picture is a screenshot of the top of the code, which is written in Python. And the two pictures on the bottom row simulate what the robot would say. This is the skills texting function that I was talking about before. So basically the gray text boxes are what the students type or say to the robot, and the white text boxes will be the robot's responses. For the navigation portion, one of our former team members who also worked with LexisNexis had a Swift Nav folder, so we started the research there. And the next step was to research slam maps, raw slider sensors, and raw Z camera navigation and autonomous driving. Currently, I'm working on the wiring of the Swift Nav components, and after that, I can start using the ROS library to actually operate the Swift Nav. And here's a diagram of the components and the wiring structure. The basic idea is that one of the GNSS antennas will connect to a computer and the other one would connect to the antenna on the robots. Uh, Mr. Donovan, back to you. As you can see, I have the privilege of working with some amazing students. Uh, the main reason uh, behind wanting to give them the platform was so they could have an opportunity to share some of the amazing work that they've done as you can see, the security robot is more than just a security robot. Uh, it's an information port. It's a place where students can go uh, 
collect information, but also it gives a window into uh, our campus for our security personnel. I want to thank all of the students that I had the privilege of working with. Also to extend my thanks again to HPCC Systems for this amazing opportunity. And at this point, I would like to turn uh, the floor over to uh, Mr. Robert Kennedy. Hey, thank you very much. Boy, that's a, that's a tough act to follow, I have to say. My name's uh, Robert Kennedy. Um, I'm here to talk to you about my uh, work this summer I did uh, at uh, HPCC Systems. I did a, uh, a third internship um, with them this year. Um, this year, uh, I worked on leveraging GPU acceleration for um, uh, the GNN bundle. Uh, I added uh, multi-node and multi-GPU acceleration um, using the GNM bundle. Um, I performed um, performance tests and evaluations uh, to prove that it in fact works, um, as well as uh, to demonstrate the speed up. Um, I compared GPUs um, versus a traditional CPU, um, and the CPUs were a, a linear speed up. Um, and I tested it using various different neural network model sizes and um, data set sizes. So the GNN bundle um, is a uh, HPCC bundle uh, created by Roger Dev. Um, you can find it on GitHub and um, it runs um, on pretty much any HPCC systems. Um, and like any other bundle, um, you use um, ECL. Um, the bundle uses TensorFlow um, and Python under the hood to provide um, you, the ECL developer, um, a way to define, uh, train, and consume or predict with a neural network model, um, all in ECL using data that has been sprayed onto uh, your cluster. Um, this bundle also has a facility to sort of convert data um, from a traditional uh, HPCC record into um, an acceptable format for use in um, for use in in the bundle itself. Um, it converts them into what's called an n-dimensional array. Um, which is a pretty standard uh, terminology if you're familiar with um, uh, NumPy arrays, uh, which is a Python scientific package. Um, this particular bundle um, improvement um, uses uh, multiple Thor nodes, um, but is limited to using CPUs for the actual neural network computations. Um, but because the GNN is using TensorFlow and Python under the hood, um, adding GPU acceleration um, which is the, was the, the main goal of this of this project um, didn't require two didn't require any custom CUDA work or any uh, real low level programming uh, to the actual GPUs, which um, is nice because it really speeds up the process. So we'll go over an example um, using GNN. Um, we're going to go ahead and build a, a convolutional neural network. Um, the type of neural network that was used in the previous part of the presentation uh, was Stallion. Um, this neural network um, doesn't recognize faces, but it recognizes um, images of handwritten digits, um, namely the MNIST data set. There's uh, 60,000 images of handwritten digits, zero through nine. Um, each picture or image is um, pretty small, it's 28 by 28 pixels, uh, and each pixel is either a value from uh, 0 to 255, so it's a, a monochrome image. Um, this is a 10 class classification problem, of course. Um, when you import the data from the MNIST data set, which is essentially just a list of images, um, you, can, you can spray them into um, HPCC using the data type, um, in this case data 784, because there's 784 pixels uh, per image, so it's, it's using the blob type. Um, you then have to convert that into, uh, for use in GNN, um, a set of unsigned integers. As you can see over here on the right-hand side, uh, it's just a set of unsigned one, and I, I call them pixel. Um, you also have a label. This is the, this is the class label. Um, so if it's a picture of an eight, the label will be an eight. Uh, and this unsigned, <clears throat> excuse me, this unsigned ID is, um, is, is needed uh, just for GNN to keep track of everything. Um, you take this data, this, this training data and your test data, and you convert it into 
uh, an n-dimensional tensor. Um, and the way uh, you sort of read these is this is the featured shape. Um, it's 60,000 comma 28 comma 28 comma one. So this is signifying that um, after you use the GNN tool or GNN functions to convert it into, um, into a tensor, um, it's a tensor that has 60,000 instances. Um, and then because they're images, it's 28 by 28. Um, and then the last dimension in this case is one because it's monochrome. Um, if this was an RGB image, um, it would be three. Or if you had an RGBD image, you could have it be four. Um, and since it's n-dimensional, you can add as many dimensions as you want. Um, the label are separated into its own tensor. Um, in this case, just 60,000. And then there's only uh, 10 possible um, class labels um, for each digit. Um, specifically in GNN, um, the first digit will always be a zero, um, just because it will tell the system that there is some number of uh, instances. You don't really have to define it. Um, that way, HPCC can it can do its magic and split up the data uh, the best way it sees, uh, which is obviously what HPC is so very good at. Um, now that we have the data ready, uh, we have to build a CNN. Uh, and the way you do that is using a Python string. This particular um, string is um, using Keras. So if you have um, uh, done some work with uh, Keras or TensorFlow already, uh, this would be very quick for you to get up and going. Um, you just sort of define your various layers uh, and shapes and your inputs. You can see here the input shape is 28 by 28 by one. You just omit the number of instances because the neural network is just going to accept one instance at a time. Um, add the layers as you see fit. Um, this just happens to be a fairly simple CNN with 34,000 uh, trainable parameters. Uh, and the very uh, last output layer is um, just 10 neurons, one for each class. So what are we actually calculating? Um, a brief overview of artificial neural networks. Um, very brief. Um, they are um, sort of look like this. Uh, there's essentially um, a bunch of nodes and each node or neuron is connected to um, a bunch of other neurons in the next layer. Uh, it was um, inspired by biological neurons. Um, as you can see here, the input layer, um, you'd have uh, as many uh, input uh, nodes as you would features. In this case, there's 784 pixels. We have 784 uh, features. Uh, this is a fully connected network. This this image does not rec um, is not a representation of the CNN. It's just a representation of a standard fully connected uh, neural network. Um, but as you can see here, the fully connected means each neuron is connected to every neuron in the next layer, uh, and then so on and so forth until you get to your final output layer. Each of these black arrows um, represents a weight um, that is initially, at the very beginning, initialized randomly across the whole network. But it's these weights that have to be incrementally changed during the training process um, to essentially make your neural network be usable. Um, it has to go through a lot of training and learning to adjust the uh, weight. So when you say your training model or your model's learning something, it's you're adjusting each one of those um, those weights. In our case, about 34,000 of them. So where do the GPUs come into play? Well, the GPUs are used for the, um, the real computationally expensive part of training a neural network. Um, namely the forward pass, what's called the forward pass and the backwards pass. Um, the forward pass, you take your input, in this case, an input image and input them pixel by pixel, the, the value into each neuron and propagate the weights by multiplying the weights plus biases and you multiply it all the way out. Um, and at the end, you can calculate your error, how wrong you quantify, how wrong your, your network is compared to uh, what it should have been. So if your uh, network thinks an image is three, but it's supposed to be you know, a nine, um, there's a way to quantify how wrong it is. Uh, based off of that, uh, that how wrong it is, the backwards pass goes from the output layer all the way up into the first hidden layer, incrementally adjusting each one of those weights, each one of those trainable parameters by a very small amount based off of the error it had previously calculated. Now this step, both, both these steps have to occur for each individual image and each weight has to be calculated and each error has to be calculated 
many, many times. Um, and it's a fairly um, linear process. So you can paralyze some of it, but you can't paralyze it um, as well as you'd hope uh, because each, each, uh, each weight between one layer to the next is dependent on the previous. So you have to calculate previous layer uh, both in forward and backwards propagation. So offloading this onto something very specialized, very high performance like a GPU uh, drastically speeds up the computations. Uh, you can of course do this on a CPU. Um, it just will take much longer. So um, this, like I said before, this is my third year. Um, previous work um, used a um, non-traditional HPCC approach uh, where it was one Thor can only use um, up to the number of GPUs a specific computer could have on its motherboard. Um, this year it was using and extending the GNN bundle. So it can use as many Thors as you want uh, and as many GPUs as you want. However, th there is some you know, cap. You can't use you know, 10,000 GPUs just because um, the way the, um, the parallelization doesn't quite scale uh, perfectly linear. Um, when you set up your system, um, each Thor um, node is assigned is essentially assigned to a uh, a single GPU um, across any number of physical machines. Um, so if you have uh, two machines with eight GPUs each, you can have sixteen Thor nodes, and you can look at it like each Thor has its own GPU for for uh, offloading the computations. Um, the way it's doing this is, is considered a data parallel approach. So each Thor node or each GPU is given a, uh, a copy of the entire neural network model. At the very beginning, it's that randomly initialized model, but it's copied across all Thors and all GPUs. And a slice of the overall training data is then given to the GPU uh, for, for computations. Um, this is where HPCC can kind of work its magic and decide how much uh, data to give each Thor node. Um, each GPU or each Thor will then calculate um, the weight updates for each image that it's given. Um, you can tell how many times to do it, how many epochs you want to do it before aggregation, but it's at predetermined points, the, um, the, 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 the partially trained neural network model on each GPU will be all slightly different because you've just trained on different data has to be aggregated. Um, so the weight updates uh, are then aggregated uh, and then redistributed to each GPU at a predetermined point. Um, you, you have to do this, which does break the um, how, how well you can parallelize this. Um, because if you don't do this, what you end up having is some number of individually trained neural networks. And it's basically an ensemble. When you do the weight updates, you're having a, a, a you know, a symphony of GPUs working towards one uh, single neural network, uh, which is which is the goal. So go on to the performance evaluation. Uh, the tests I did um, were on uh, uh, AWS instances. Uh, I used two, uh, P, they're called P2.8 extra large. Um, each of them have eight NVIDIA GPUs, K80s. Um, which are rather old, uh, they still work very well, uh, and one M5 extra large for the head node. Um, so I have a, um, uh, a different cluster size, this different cluster sizes I tested. I tested um, cluster size of two, four, eight, and 16, both using CPU only and GPU only uh, for the um, each one of the trials. Uh, we used three neural network sizes, um, one that was 34,000, um, one six million, one sixty-eight million trainable parameters. So there's sixty-eight million of those little arrows, um, and then I trained each one of those models across um, three different data set sizes that equated to um, a five megabyte, a five hundred megabyte, and a five gigabyte um, instance or train, training data set size. Sorry, uh, for a total of thirty-six trials. So as you may have guessed, um, GPU speed up over CPU is quite significant. Um, this is uh, a graph showing that it's 9.2 times faster to use a dual GPU setup um, over a dual CPU setup. Now, the CPUs on these instances are no slouches. They're pretty high-end Intel Xeons. 
Um, these K-80s, although very powerful when they were created, um, they are now several years old and they are, compared to the new, the new GPUs, quite slow. Uh, if you compared, if, if we had run these tests with you know, newer GPUs, um, say something like the V100 or something, um, the performance gap would be even greater. Um, and this is because um, NVIDIA has really um, focused on building GPUs that are really good at playing video games, for one thing, but also training neural networks and, and consuming neural networks. It's a very big part of their business, whereas Intel it might not be. So their CPUs are very good for a general processing unit, you know, basically what a CPU is supposed to do. So each year the GPUs get exponentially faster uh, as compared to a, uh, a CPU. So as you can see here, uh, using a GPU is always faster than using a CPU um, in our tests. Um, and even a small number of GPUs is almost always faster than using a quite large number of CPUs. Um, this line here uh, is the linear is is a linear CPU speed up. Doesn't look linear because the axis is not linear. Um, but if you look at the blue, yeah, the blue line is the GPU linear speed up versus the green, which is the uh, the actual GPU speed up, the measured GPU speed up. You can see it's it's fairly close to a linear speed up. Now the linear speed up for both GPU and CPU um, is a theoretical maximum. You can't really go any faster than that just because um, if you use twice as many GPUs, it can't ever be really twice as fast. Um, the efficiency of the system is quite interesting to look at. Um, as you can see here on the smallest neural network size, um, the G all GPUs cluster sizes were always faster than a CPU, uh, but, but not by much. Um, these numbers here are speed ups uh, averaged across um, all cluster sizes between two and 16. Um, but as you can see here, once you get a sufficiently large neural network size, um, in this case, six million instances, uh, six million uh, parameters, the speed up starts to get much, much bigger. And if you get even larger in the neural network size, as you increase the data size, the GPUs only get more efficient. And if you know um, anything about uh, neural networks is you'll know that these models are getting significantly bigger and the data set sizes we're training on are growing at an exponential rate. So to have the efficiency essentially increase as the complexity increases is, um, is pretty cool. Um, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, you can check out my experiments um, at this link here, uh, my GitHub. You can check out the GNM bundle uh, itself at this link here. Uh, the branch 454 has these GPU editions uh, integrated already. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the GNN, which I would really encourage you to do, um, you can check out a GNN blog on how to use it. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, after this in 20 minutes, I'll be at the poster session. Please come by, take a look at my poster, and uh, don't forget to vote who your favorite uh, poster is. So uh, back to you, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your presentations. Ty, Jack, Robert, really appreciate it. Uh, we have time for Q&A. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. I see the question, uh, what still needs to be done to get the robot fully operational? Well, fully operational is somewhat of a, a loaded term. Uh, we have a joke around here that we really never finish a project, it just keeps evolving. Uh, in the stage that we're in right now, 
Uh, we're taking uh, the modifications that they did during, uh, you know, the COVID distance portion, which was a real big challenge for us to work on this robot remotely. So much of what we do uh, is in this group, uh, collaborative, hands-on environment. Uh, so the next phase will be taking their individual components and mounting the hardware on the robot. Uh, right now, we do have a fully functional a platform that can drive around. Uh, Karina was working on enhancing uh, the autonomous capabilities. Uh, for us right now, it's going to be taking the CAD that they've done, turn those into mounting hardware brackets. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, doing the, the actual testing, we'll have students that are on the robotics competition team come in, take pictures, we'll test the facial recognition and really the experience of the user um, you know, uh, interacting with the robot. So, you know, like I said, the project will, it will get to that next phase, uh, but this will be a platform that we will use for years to come uh, on the team and in my classroom. Oh, I do see, I do see we have another question of how we uh, plan to address a uh, facial mask and uh, facial recognition. So that is a good question. Uh, so far, uh, I've actually been testing with that. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, variety in that from, you know, people wearing different kind of face masks and stuff. So uh, it's it's really uh, kind of difficult to do that, but uh, it's a work in progress and hopefully I can figure something out with that. But uh, from what I've seen is, you know, when people wear different colored uh, masks, you know, one day, the other day, uh, special designs and stuff, it really does change a lot of things. So I, I will try to come up with something for that. But as, as of right now, that is, that's still something on the plate. So. Uh, I guess I see a, a question for me. Uh, it says, uh, does the user have to do anything special to uh, get access to the GPUs that are available? Um, once you have a um, a system, an instance or a local or a local machine that has um, GPUs, you have to uh, make sure that they have, uh, you're using NVIDIA GPUs for now, uh, and you have the appropriate uh, CUDA software installed for um, your uh, system. Um, but other than that, um, you don't really have to do quite a whole lot. Uh, you just sort of have to uh, pull in that branch that I talked about, 454, that has the GPU work. Uh, and all of the GPU stuff <laughs> happens in the background. Um, so no, not really. You can you can so sort of just just use it. Uh, and I and I forgot to mention in in the um, in the presentation uh, another point. The GPUs are very good at um, uh, it, it consuming these neural network models too. So uh, potentially in the future, a um, something like a robot could be using this GNN bundle with GPU to uh, potentially use a GPU and uh, GNN on board a, a robot and speed up the, um, the inference time. So you could maybe in the future have something uh, that does the computations locally uh, utilizing the GPUs. Are there any other questions? So there's another one. Um, it's called, or it says, uh, do I think the GNN acceleration or improvement scales proportionally uh, as the networks get deeper or different types or more complicated networks like an LSTM or a GAN? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I only had enough time to really explore um, a CNN, uh, per to perform a performance evaluation on a CNN. Um, but what, from what I've seen um, using GPU acceleration outside of HPCC using just TensorFlow uh, and other tools, uh, yes, the GPUs will um, have a significant improvement um, on more complicated networks. Um, anecdotally, I have noticed um, with HPCC um, and the GNN on GPU, um, the CNNs were much, uh, the performance was much, the performance gap between CPUs and GPUs was much greater uh, on a CNN compared to like a, an MLP. 
Um, and the CNN is obviously much more complicated than an MLP. So I would think um, as the network complexities and size increase, um, yes, the GPU uh, efficiency will also uh, increase. Are there other questions? We actually can follow up. There was a question earlier. I don't think we answered fully. Uh, Jack was going to address that question now. So uh, I also see in the part of that question that I forgot to address is that uh, you asked about uh, different uh, complexions of, you know, darker complexion skin and stuff like that. So uh, in the data, uh, the data set that I had, there really wasn't much uh, variation for that. Uh, there's still, that's still something I wanted to test, but uh, once we get a larger data set, like our entire school, there'd be a lot of variation, but uh, that's still something we're working on. So. And uh, like I said before, the, the project evolves over time. Uh, with COVID, uh, we were severely restricted to, uh, you know, data from the immediate uh, group of students that I have here. We're hoping that when we have less restrictions uh, on campus, when we do have students uh, returning fully, we do plan on um, bringing this to a larger audience. We'll invite students from the campus to voluntarily go through. They will take pictures in different scenarios. And some of them will be going to other classes right now. The, the main uh, barrier that we have, and I think in the question uh, from David before, with the use of facial masks, um, so much going on right now, it does pose a significant um, challenge. So we would have to uh, put greater priority to uh, pupil distance um, features of obviously uh, the forehead, uh, you know, whatever is visible at that time, but the face mask, if you pair that with a hat, uh, there is very little um, other than the eyes and the exposed uh, part of the face to make that uh, comparison. And that does pose significant challenges, but one that we will, under the circumstances, be addressing. Okay, uh, since we don't have any more questions and we're about two minutes away from our session being over anyway, I will, I want to thank everyone for attending. I appreciate all the presenters giving their presentations. Everybody have a good day. Thank you very much.